This is episode 28 of Environmental Professionals. My name is John Lieber. You can reach me on Twitter or Instagram, which is at jungle underscore capital. Happy to have my guest Kit here today. So Kit, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for your time. Uh, can you please get us started by introducing yourself? Okay, so I'm Kit Prendergast, also known as the Bee Bay Vet, and I am a native bee ecologist from Australia. Um, awesome, and, and I've seen a lot of your research and um, a lot of your, I've had some interactions with you so far, so I'm really excited to have you here today and kind of um, dig a little deeper into what I've seen. Um, just to kind of get us a little started about your, your general interest, uh, can you tell us how you got started in the field? What made you interested in, in pollinators? So I actually never thought that I would be um, a bee scientist or work with invertebrates. I have degrees in zoology and conservation biology, as well as an English and cultural studies degree. Um, and I actually did my honours research on horse behaviour because ever since I was a little girl, I was horse crazy, but my parents never supported that. And so when I got the chance to um, potentially devise my own project in honours, I, I wanted to look at horse behaviour. So I did that. And then um, whilst I loved it, working with horses is very challenging from a scientific point of view because um, they're large animals. You can't get a big sample size. Um, you know, to get ethics approval and all that sort of thing. Um, so then I, I had a year where I was working as a research assistant at the University of Western Australia, um, sorting marine invertebrates. And I guess that sort of um, firstly opened my eyes to the incredible diversity of invertebrates there and how much we don't know about them. Um, and then I was thinking of all these different PhD projects and most of them weren't on invertebrates. They were mainly on um, looking at the effect of climate change on um, long neck tortoises or looking at keeping marsupials as pets as an alternative to cats. So cats are a big issue in Australia. Um, looking at um, how um, cuttlefish uh, change colour and pattern. I had like all these different ideas and then um, I went to a, a talk by the West Australian Naturalist Group and there's this um, old gentleman and he was showing photos of native bees and I was like wow like I did not know that all these different native bees occurred here um, and then when I dug a bit deeper I realized that there was um, yeah lots not known about that, even how many native bees we have here in Western Australia which is a biodiversity hotspot um, and, you know, where we're known for having such an amazing wildflower um, diversity, but there was less known about our native bees, especially in an urban area. Um, so there's so much research on bees in agricultural areas. And I realized that um, the study of bees in urban areas was a, a nascent, but really um, rapidly increasing field. And unlike uh, um, agricultural areas where it's very, I guess, hard to make major um, changes with urban areas. There's a lot more potential for people to design their gardens differently. And I also um, wanted to look at the impact of honeybees because uh, honeybees are, you know, very big industry, um, but they're an introduced species in many places of the world, including Western Australia. And Australia is quite special in that we don't have varroa mite. So we've got like massively healthy honeybee populations. And um, whilst that's good for our uh, economic perspective, it might not be very good for an environmental perspective. So that's, I guess um, I started, um, I, I came up with this like, this broad idea of looking at competition. Um, so m like major ecological questions, interspecies competition, invasion biology, urban ecology, um, native plant pollinator um, interactions, and then um, yeah, I had to find a supervisor. So I actually came up with a project myself. I had to find a supervisor. Um, none of my supervisors are, are really native bee scientists, so that was quite challenging. Um, and then um, had to get money. Um, so I applied for a forest research um, scholarship and was one of three people in in the world that that got it um so that was that was great and then just went from there yeah 
That's great. And that actually is insightful because um, I was going through your research and I thought the, out, the horse research was kind of an outlier of your other research. So that, that it's kind of insightful because I think for younger environmental professionals, it shows that the trajectory of your career isn't always what you think it's going to be, but it can, one thing can really lead to another and it shows like how it's worked out for you so good. Yeah. Um, before, before I ask you just to kind of tell us a little bit about your, your actual research and the findings, um, are you still doing your PhD right now or, or what is your current status of so I um, I've spent the last week um, after four months of procrastination um, doing so my, my thesis, I finished it, uh, it was submitted and it was passed with minor revisions um, and I got that in January and I just, I was at the stage where I, I didn't really want to look at my thesis again. Um, but then we just had um, over the last um, few days, just a, a three day sort of like minor lockdown in Western Australia. And I was like, well, I've got nothing better to do with my life right now. So I'm going to um, knuckle into my thesis. So, and it was, yeah, it was, it was the, the comments from the examiners were actually really, really lovely. Um, and so I just, yeah, I need to do those, those little minor revisions and um, send it off. And, and then I, I'll be, you know, have my ceremony, get the piece of paper, get the funny hat and get to be uh, Dr. B. Babette. So, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> That's really exciting. And um, I'm, I'm glad that the research has taken you in the direction it has, because I've found as someone that doesn't really work directly with pollination or wildflowers, but more just general environmental issues, um, that the native plant conversation, honeybees, it's one of, I think it's right up there with, it's probably one of the most misunderstood um, issues um, among even among environmental professionals. Oh my so god! So to yes. have you, yeah, to have you providing clarity um, is even like I use your research to send to people all the time. So it's really um, making a big difference, I think, in in the general culture. Um, mm -hmm. But can you tell us a little bit about um, your, your your research findings or, or your research and the findings, just a general kind of overview? Yeah, so um, my research actually um, ended up being a lot bigger than I, I thought it would be. But um, in, I guess, a, a nutshell, um, I was looking at what factors influence the distribution and abundance of native bees, their um, species richness and number of individuals in urban areas. I was comparing um, people's gardens with native vegetation um, remnants. In Australia, we call it bushland, um, but you know, uh, remnant um, wildlands or um, that sort of thing. And um, what are the sort of like correlates of native bees? So I looked at, at each of my sites, a heap of, of variables, like the proportion of um, built space in the environment, the number of flowers, the number of species of flowers, the proportion of native flowers, um, and um, the amount of bare ground, the number of trees. And I also constructed pollination networks and analyzed their properties, their structural properties. So this is, you look at which bees visit which flowers and um, calculates these, these properties that show how robust a pollination network is to extinction, for example, how connected it is. Um, and um, then I, I looked at um, whether honeybees were influencing uh, the native bee populations. And so my, my major um, first finding was that um, people's gardens can't replace remnant vegetation. So there, there's an idea that like gardens are havens for, for pollinators and it's okay if we clear these like, you know, sort of unused um, patches of vegetation because, you know, we've still got gardens and people's gardens actually have more species of flowers. And I actually found that more species of flowers meant fewer bees. And this goes, I guess, against like a common orthodoxy, but it's because um, native bees, they just don't visit, unlike honeybees that will visit pretty much any flowers and they're generalists. So they, they sort of need to visit lots of flowers to get their full nutritional um, uh, requirements. Quite a few native bees specialize on plants in a single lineage. Um, and many of these plants, you know, in Australia are native and the, the common garden plants are exotics. So when you've got a garden full of exotics and native flowers make up only a tiny proportion, you know, uh, populations can't exist on five 
native flowers. So that was um, a really sort of um, interesting finding. Um, and then um, that the pollination networks were also much more uh, healthier in the bushland remnants. Um, and there was greater competition for, for floral, resource, floral resources in the residential gardens. Then when it came to honeybees, I found that they, the more honeybees there were, the more unstable these pollination networks were. Um, and they um, monopolized um, the, the plants. And when it came to um, looking at whether they had a negative influence on native bees, the results were um, like not clear cut. And that's because uh, when you look at things in a really broad perspective, honeybees aren't going to interact with every single bee species. So you really need to look at the ecology of the species in bowls. So I found that whilst honeybees had no association with overall bee um, abundance, I found that for the native bees that were bigger, so they had larger any um, resource requirements, um, honeybees negatively affected those, um, but not the small bees. Um, and then the, the bees that had a high overlap in sharing the same floral preferences, those ones were negatively affected. The ones that um, didn't though, um, you know, foraged on different flower species, they weren't negatively affected. So it all makes ecological sense, but um, it just shows that you need um, an ecological theoretical foundation um, when you're, you're addressing these these questions um, about competition and you know ab about urban um, design for pollinators. So just planting any flowers um, isn't isn't really going to do the trick. Um, and needing like considering the the uh, ecology and evolutionary history of species is is quite important. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating because I think that people like to just adopt whatever easy narratives and then run with it. So I, when you were talking about higher diversity doesn't necessarily always mean um, that it's better habitat for bees, I think is really interesting because um, it's complex, it sounds like, and it's like very nuanced straight on what bees need for specific areas and, mm -hmm. and uh, what their habitat requirements are. Um, how do you summarize then, like in your own opinion, um, when, when someone says like, why are native plants more important than non-native plants for honey or for bees, um, native bees? So <coughs> bees, you know, the native bees, they have co-evolved with particular flora um, over, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And when you've got exotic plants, they haven't evolved to recognize them as food. Um, so I guess if you want like an analogy, um, you know, there are some, uh, some countries um, in Asia that, for example, eat insects, but much of the like Western world, you know, we, when we see insects, we don't see them as food at all. Um, and I think it's that, that same sort of, you know, if you haven't like, for us, it's a cultural thing, of course, but, um, you know, an analogy, like they, they won't be able to, visit them and then there have been experiments where you know especially for the specialist bees you know they've plants sometimes have um defense mechanisms um you know that the bees have to evolve to be able to break down properly so you've got these specialized um co-evolutionary relationships and the bees you know need these particular flower species to survive and if they try and develop on the nectar and pollen other um, flower species and it's it's suboptimal and um, it's not you know not not within their requirements. And yes, there are general species that will visit um, exotic plants, um, but you know they're they're not the ones that we need to worry about. We need to worry about the the specialized bees. So that's why the the native flora are so important. So sure, some general some some exotic flowers will definitely be visited, but your you know you're just um, going to be catering to a subset. Of biodiversity and the the subset that isn't as um, in need of, of conservation help. And from your uh, research scan or just your general um, knowledge, does that concept of native plants for native bees extend to other areas of the world as well? Um, yeah, it does, but it would be of course different native flowers. Um, so here, for example, in Australia, um, it's particularly important because Australia has been isolated from other countries 
for millions of years you know everyone knows we've got like weird stuff here we've got marsupials we've got like all these snakes that are, um, are deadly um we've got you know uh you know the the echidnas for example and the platypuses um so you know a very uh unique um composition of animals and also of plants so um, lots of our native bees are specialized on metaceae. So these are, you know, in Australia, the iconic eucalyptus, um, the gum tree. Uh, I can, I've done surveys where I've collected um, almost 40 species of native bees from a single um, species of eucalyptus. Um, so these, this is a bit uh, unique in that, um, for example, in Europe, you don't really have these mass blossoming um, trees. Most of your trees are like, uh, gymnosperms and um, conifers and, and, and stuff like that but um, you know you've got you do have specialized um, relationships and for example I know like we don't have bumblebees here which is sad <laughs> I love bumblebees but they've got different tongue lengths and um, you know some are adapted to reaching deep within coral flowers of that, that have deep corollas um, the bumblebees with shorter tongues can't can't reach those so you've still got these um, specialized co-evolutionary relationships and you know given that um, again it's the thing is though it's not just any native plant species you really need to look at what the bees are visiting um, so uh, kangaroo paws um, and nicosanthus on um, there the western australian um, wildflower emblem native bees don't visit them they're, they're pollinated by birds but they're but they're certainly native um but yeah. yeah you actually need to do the research um unfortunately it's not, there's not really a, a shortcut um you have yeah. to look at but there's there's more and more um, researchers um publishing papers like i just can't keep up i've got like a massive folder on my laptop called um b articles to read which i probably will never ever read but it's for my like peace of mind that i'm like oh that's such a cool study i'm like i love that i need to read that that's that's awesome there's there's so much research being done especially um in the northern hemisphere and um you know, I, I'm very jealous um, of how much um, research and projects and stuff there are. And there's bee certification schemes for farms and, and like bee friendly campuses. And Australia, despite being like a, you know, first world country and everything, we are like massively lagging behind. We don't even know how many bee species we have. We don't even know how we, they're doing. Like they're not being monitored or anything. Um, so it's really um, quite embarrassing and depressing. Um, That's but good. Yeah, there's, there's lots of information out there. Um, I know in, um, I can't pronounce it because I just read it. Um, it's X-E-R-O-S Society. Um, they have lots of information um, for um, bees. I think in the UK, there's um, a bumblebee organization that's got lots of um, information there. So yeah, there are um, resources, but just like typing in bee friendly flowers on the internet. Um, isn't very helpful. You have to go to scientific, you know, publications or scientists or organizations that, that have a scientific background. Yeah, and it's really great to see this uh, kind of building narrative of research coming out um, in the volume that it has been because um, I was a practitioner for so long. I was working with the City of Toronto in their forestry department. And the problem is, is that um, when you're selecting plants, you're, go you're going up against the landscaping and nursery industry, which has kind of their, their ways set. And um, having some sort of like uh, actual research to um, base your decision making on really, really helps um, kind of fight against that. But there does seem to be a, uh, a bit of a battle going on when you're trying to um, make that push for native plants that help support um, pollinators. So it's good to see um, that type of research coming out that supports um, those decisions. Yeah, and it's a I bit crazy because your... like native plants, they tend to be adapted to the soils and the climate. So they're like less um, effort. And, um, you know, I don't know about other countries, but I'm sure it applies. But, you know, in Western Australia, we've got like beautiful wildflowers. Um, I don't really know why people wouldn't well, want I think it's very clear. The reason is that if you don't need to water, prune, rake, all these maintenance efforts, because if, for example, um, I know in like Canada, if you're going to plant tulips, it takes so much effort and maintenance to, to keep these flowers. 
But when you just say, oh, why don't we put native plants and you never have to do anything, it cuts a lot, of, it threatens a, an entire industry basically mm -hmm. um, because they don't need to be hired anymore. So I think there's a huge lobbying against that. And I really felt that as a practitioner, there was, it was quite cutthroat at times when, when native plants were being proposed. Um, wow. So I think it's just, yeah, I think it's just an adjustment period. Um, but hopefully it moves in the right direction. And um, what I wanted to feed into is how industry is sometimes um, manipulating the new uh, um, approach as well. So, and I wanted to get your opinion on it. So one of the things is uh, there was a big push uh, where I was, where I'm from in Ontario to, to, do, to make native plants um, popular for use. And then the first thing that was done by the landscaping industry is they took native plants and then they made cultivars. So it would be like, you would have your native flower that was white, but they would turn it purple. Um, so I wanted to know what your, I know your research isn't directly related to that, but what do you think your, your general sense is on cultivars of native plants? Do you think that it would impact uh, bee behavior? Because I think of like their visual cues must be related. I, I get, I, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly the nuances, but I wonder what your initial thoughts are on cultivars. Yeah, so I um, actually did um, a bit of research just recently. I finished writing the report, but I haven't written the publication yet, um, where I went to a, uh, a native plant nursery that also had some exotics and also, as you said, um, native cultivars. And I spent, um, I, I went there for four months, once a month, and spent 200 seconds looking at every single plant species. And there was like 200 plant species. Um, so even though 200 seconds isn't like, a very long time going around all the plants it was um and then I like recorded the color and also whether it was a horticultural variety a native plant and recorded um what insects visited it and I found that actually the there was no difference between whether it was a horticultural variety or not and I think though it will really depend upon uh, how it's been modified so sometimes it can be actually modified um, for the better, better for the bees. So say like we love um, really bright blue flowers and um, it creates a, a bigger, like maybe there's a, a bigger um, petal or maybe we, we like flowers that smell more. And so there's a stronger scent there. So in that way, they can be more attractive to bees. But then when we maybe select them um, for having double petals, which actually makes it harder for bees to access the nectar, um, if like select them for um, a different color that might not be as attractive or just select them and you know due, due to often um, traits having like been correlated either because the same gene codes for numerous things or because um, the genes are very close on the chromosome so you end up selecting one thing but another one gets hitch hitchhiked along um, it can make them less attractive so I guess like this this happens with like all of my research Pretty much the answer is always it depends yeah. and uh yeah it's it depends i found um no difference but maybe if i went to a different nursery that had different um cultivars it might be a different a different story right oh that's really interesting um and yeah it, that, that's really what it always comes down to is it really depends on because there's so much um, diversity of plants and flowers and bee and um, behavior so that makes sense that it's, it depends um, and it's funny that you said um, we are very interested in uh, how flowers smell that seems to be a big attraction of um, humans to flowers and I always had like a anecdotal theory and I wanted to ask an actual pollination expert do humans ever pollinate flowers when we like smell flower to flower or in other ways, is there are humans pollinators in some sense? As far as I know, no, we're not unless we intentionally pollinate them. So there are, um, you know, in China, it's quite well known that because of um, they've got like these big monocultures um, full of pesticides, and there's not enough bees to service, and they have humans hand pollinate the flowers. And in Australia, um, tomatoes there in um, honeybees can't pollinate tomatoes and tomatoes need quite um, specific conditions um, on a commercial scale and so they're grown in greenhouses and um, they won't release their pollen unless they're vibrated a particular fre frequency. Bumblebees are great at this, um, our native amygdala bees are great at this but 
they can't be managed in greenhouses. So humans go around um, using either uh, electric toothbrushes or vibrators to, oh, um, <laughs> to uh, pollinate them. Um, and so, yeah, humans can pollinate stuff, but it's not usually um, unintentionally. It's, it's because yes. we need to pollinate them. Yeah. Um, the other uh, kind of uh, like a new topic that's being explored and uh, that I wanted your opinion on too is assisted migration. So people are talking about, okay, the planet is warming and especially like a good place to look at it more clearly to understand because I don't know the dynamics of Australia, but is in North America where um, you could look at plant species and the projection is that they're going to be moving increasingly north as um, as the climate warms. So people are saying we should not wait for the uh, the climate to change. We should be taking native plant species from the south and bringing them to the north to establish early so that there's already populations there. But then it creates this dynamic where you're planting non-native species in, in areas, um, but they're kind of native because it's like maybe uh, you know, just a couple uh, growing zones south. Um, so it's controversial, and I also, and I just wanted your um, kind of general thoughts on that. Well, I actually published a paper um, on that topic um, <laughs> in the journal Austral Ecology, and the title of that paper is "Critiquing the Notion of a Species Natural Range in an Era of Unprecedented Change," and um, this is a my my articles to make people think and I, I outline the pros and cons but basically um I think that it is you know we we are losing species and species are declining and climate change is you know a, a massive threat that um you know is is unprecedented and at the rate of climate change and with all the barriers so species um to in light of climate change, um, they can either adapt or migrate. So migrate up or migrate south. Um, and we live in very fragmented landscapes nowadays by roads, by buildings. Um, we don't have continuous tracts of land, which makes it very hard for, for species to migrate. And so sometimes um, if we're going to save the species um, and we need to take a bit of a, a reactionary approach and you know given species we know um species have been moving around the planet you know all the time um if if it's done for conservation reasons if we you know make sure that we first assess that they um aren't going to become invasive they aren't going to outcompete other species but given that, that we're doing this usually for species that are of conservation concern so they're already at low you know they're not not species that are like already running rampant um and they you know we want to help conserve them and it's not um you know putting them somewhere you know outlandish, um, I think it is a, a strategy that we need to start considering. Um, you know, sure, there, there certainly are risks, but I guess, you know, is, is the risk of them going extinct, um, you know, what are the, the costs and benefits there? Um, so it's, yeah, yeah it's obviously a, a controversial one, but I think it's something that we definitely need to start um, talking about and maybe trialing. Yeah, it might be another it depends um, answer too, because where I've seen it, it's usually species that are very common in the south. And then, if, I mean, in the North American context, they're very common in the south. And then you're asking yourself, okay, I have this limited area of planting. Do I plant the native species or do I plant these non-native species? And if it is non-native, should there be a certain ratio? Should there be um, like very small amount or a very large amount because considering our confidence is quite high that so I think there's a lot of research that needs to be done there to kind of clarify our opinions on it because um, it's increasingly becoming something that you're right should be considered and we want to do the right thing because um, it's it's uh, it's complicated and you want to make sure you are doing the right thing but you could see how it could go wrong quite easily as well um, say that the climate projections were wrong or something or it becomes invasive and wipes out the native habitat before the climate goes. There's a lot that could go wrong, but there's also a lot that can go right 
And I think that your sentiment about if there's a conservation um, status issue where the species is dwindling in its, in its habitat, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I wanted to also just ask uh, for kind of general homeowners on um, what, what people can do to really make their own property uh, a haven for, for native pollinators. Yeah, so um, you need to think about both their foraging and nesting habitat. So foraging um, high proportions of native bee friendly plants. So um, look at what scientific research has been published in um, your area um, and um, look at what, what, what flowers the bees have been visiting and what, what types of bees and what, what um, types of bees should be in your area. Um, again, the data, the, the availability of the data is gonna vary by country, um, but you know, there's uh, still, you know, information that's that's out there. So yeah, large proportion of, of native bee friendly plants. Um, then for nesting habitat, there's ground nesting bees. So we need to leave patches of bare soil uh, for them, um, not um, mow everything, not mulch everything, not till everything, not put fake grass down or pavement and cement everywhere. Um, pesticides and herbicides, in an agricultural context, um, the uh, more recent ones that are very targeted um, using biotechnology can help reduce um, the amount of land that needs to be cleared for crops. But in your garden, you don't need to use them, um, especially not if you're planting uh, native vegetation to have natural pest control. Um, and then the, the cavity nesting bees are uh, keeping treats. So they nest in little holes in wood created by wood boring beetles, then bee hotels. Now I've written a book called Creating a Haven for Native Bees, which has information about how to make bee hotels. So they're becoming uh, very popular, but unfortunately quite a few of them aren't very well designed. So having a massive one, like a whole wall is not a good idea because if there's parasites or diseases, um, they will just spread through um, and then, um, you need to make sure that the diameters are right. So, you know, actually it's, it's really simple. You just need holes, um, no like wood shavings and complex compartments and like little staircases or <laughs> blocks of wood and, and fancy like just, just holes, okay? Um, and they have to be um, between about two to 10 millimeters in diameter because bees are quite small um, and drilled um, with the grain of the wood so you don't get splinters that will rip the bees. Um, untreated uh, wood so the, um, you know there's not like uh, not toxic chemicals in there or you can use bamboo. Make sure that the, they are, are long enough. Um, so I say absolute minimum eight centimeters. Um, 15 centimeters is a good length. Um, so unfortunately, like lots of the ones that are sold, they don't meet these like very basic requirements. Um, as I said, it's actually not that that complex and um, they act, they do work. So I've been using big hotels in my, my research in urban areas and I just got a grant um, to put up bee hotels in areas that have been affected by fires all across Australia. So if there are any Australians um, listening and you live near or in um, an area that has been affected by fires, I would love you to get in touch because it is an Australia-wide project and I'll be doing a lot of citizen science with helping people um, make bee hotels to restore the native bees, um, enable them to nest in areas that have been affected by fires. So Australia was um, Australia's quite a fire-prone continent, but um, in 2020, we had some uh, massive fires um, across, across Australia, and um, there's been almost no research into how fires have been affecting native bees in Australia. And, um, you know, in addition to, to the flowers, obviously they need somewhere to nest, and if an intense fire goes through and wipes out um, the trees, then you just got charred stumps, which the, the native bees can't nest in. And, even though flowers can sometimes pop back very fast after fires, um, trees obviously can't. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm trialing this, this recovery effort. So um, 
you know, not just, just me doing the research, but uh, I'm hoping to engage citizens across Australia. So I'm definitely hoping for people to please get in contact with me so we can really make this a, um, an Australia-wide effort. It's interesting that you mentioned mulch too. So from a bee's pr perspective, they would rather um, nest in bare soil rather than uh, like piles of mulch along garden beds. Mm, yeah, I know that like lots of like mulch can be good from a, a water conservation perspective, but like at least leave some patches of bare soil because if you got really um, some, you know, just sort of natural leaf litter and stuff is fine. Um, or pebbles, sometimes it can be better so that they can better like locate their nests. But having like, you know, inches thick of mulch, they, it's not, not good for them. They, they won't nest in there. Um, another common thing uh, that I've seen for bees that I don't know if is actually scientifically correct thing to do is um, leaving sugar water out for them. What do you think about this? Uh, so like, you'd only do that if there was nothing else flowering. Um, and it will give them like an ability to, I guess, stay alive, but, um, not reproduce. So sugar water just provides obviously sugar, um, which gives them energy. But if they want to reproduce, the female bees need pollen, um, because that supplies the proteins and the minerals and the nutrients, um, and the fats that, that the baby bees need to develop. So, um, you know, if, if it's really cold and you see a bee struggling um, and there's not like, not gonna get to flowers, there's not much flowering, um, then yeah, like you can do that, but um, it's not like a really, you know, it's not really gonna save the bees. Yeah, yeah that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so another area of research that you, you've covered is on environmental services and for people that may not know like environmental services are what services um, the environment serves for humans whether that's flood control or clean air or whatever um, so you you talked about how that is used as a justification I, I think on on protecting biodiversity and you kind of explored that concept which is really interesting and it's almost like philosophical but also practical um, so can you just kind of talk about that research a little bit? Yeah, so that was um, another paper that I, I published um, in Austral Ecology, and um, it was called uh, Beyond Ecosystem Services as Justification for Biodiversity Conservation. And um, I basically uh, outlined how, you, you know, you know, one of the, the reasons why biodiversity is declining is because of the sort of like capitalist mentality, like um, what can we get out of the environment? What can it do for us? Um, and that that sort of mentality is, is you know, sort of, you know, uh, raping the land. Um, what can we get from it? And um, ironically, it's also the ecosystem service uh, argument is saying, you know, bees pollinate, so we need to pro protect bees because one in three mouthfuls is like, you know, pollinated by bees. Um, but there are actually a lot of bees that don't visit crops. And then, um, you know, the ones that do visit crops tend to be the generalists. Um, the, the bees that, you know, when bees are so rare, they're not going to be doing a lot of pollinating because they're rare. Um, and so, and there's also quite a bit of a uh, redundancy um, necessarily in pollination networks because you know if for example a plant species is low abundance one year um you know the bees can visit something else if a bee is at low abundance there's other species that can sort of fill in um, that's the, the beauty of biodiversity um and then there are there's some you know for example native bees that are kleptoparasites and they that parasitize other bees um if based on the ecosystem service argument, you know, we should let them go extinct. They, they don't do anything for us. But I think that's a really like stupid uh, way of looking at things. Um, and, you know, if we, like, I, I don't value another person for what they can do for me. Um, it's based on, you know, they, you know, intrinsic value. And when it comes to species and biodiversity, it's even more important because, just the the amazing fact that 
over hundreds, thousands, millions of years, um, each species, you know, diverged from a, a common ancestor and, you know, they've, they've managed to survive extinction so far. <laughs> um, and we have this amazing diversity of, of life with so many different um, strategies for adapting and living and surviving and reproducing. And it's absolutely um, astounding. It, it makes um, the world such a, a beautiful and special place. Um, so if we lose a species, that's what we lose. We, we lose, you know, millions of years of evolution, um, something, something precious. It's like, why do people value art? Um, it makes, it's, you know, it's more of a, something that, you know, almost intangible, um, that with, with biodiversity, it's even more, more special. It's just so precious. Um, so I think we need a shift that idea of what, can, you know, we need to protect something because it can do something for us. Um, to we need to protect something because wow like this is fucking amazing like this species that is you know a two millimeter long bee um it's it's a specialist on metasi it's two millimeters long there's lots of other um, insects that visit metasi they're way better pollinators but like wow like you know how could we ever let that that amazing thing um disappear so that's that's the the gist of my argument yeah, it, it's fascinating and it makes so much sense because I think what we struggle with is that we are always trying to um, quantify the value of things within uh, like a capitalist system. And that sometimes leads to like the commercialization of things. But um, I think that no matter who you ask, they understand that there's a greater connection with the environment rather than just a monetary one. And I think we just struggle with articulating the actual worth of it. But um, hopefully it's a, uh, an evolving thing that will maybe one day um, kind of grow out of its just monetary value and we can actually quantify the real um, value that it brings to us. I actually saw someone contacted me to review a, uh, um, a thesis and their thesis was talking about the spir spiritual aspect of um, biodiversity in urban areas. So they were interviewing people about their, you know, connection with nature. And I thought it was just a fascinating um, look at, um, like, a different perspective of how people interact with nature and more of a, uh, you know, there's there's sometimes things are quite abstract, but it, you know, it showed, like, quite meaningful connection that people have that's not um, just a purely, like, well, we get this many dollars for the plant being around us because I think everyone knows the value of nature within themselves we just have a really hard time articulating it for whatever reason but um, at least your research kind of recognized that there is this other value um, that we need to look into and uh, just as my last question I just wanted to ask um, what your uh, thoughts are on the most pressing uh, environmental issue of Australia do you feel like it is the uh, the pollination or is maybe perhaps the fires or extinction, or what do you what do you feel is like kind of one one of the top priorities uh, for Australia? Oh goodness, <laughs> I mean, there's so many, you know, there's so many uh, threats, and you know, Australia, uh, we have the um, the unenviable title of having the most mammal extinctions in in the last two hundred years. Uh, also one of the greatest mammal extinctions before European colonization um, when when Aborigines caused one of the the megafauna extinctions and you know over 50 genera um, when extinct um, so lots of extinction here but we're also a, a mega biodiverse country um, but you know these are things that we we know like mammals we know we know quite well um, with I think with in insects like there needs to be a uh, definitely monitoring um there needs to be legislation when people want to go clear habitat um environmental impact assessments they usually have to look out for like um numbats and bilbies and quolls um to make sure that they're not there there's not important cockatoo habitat and stuff like that but there's no and you know plants as well there's no no threatened plants um but there's no requirement to um, look at what the biodiversity of, of insects are and the, the endemic 
insects that might be there and there's no monitoring of insect species populations or any real like um, conservation actions except for some butterflies which is good people love butterflies and there is some um, work being done on them um, so I would say though like something that's sort of like an overarching threat and it impacts everything is is uh, native habitat loss so we need to stop that um, you know one of the biggest causes of habitat loss is um, clearing for livestock um, so that's something that all of us can actually address very easily by um, having a plant-based diet and again I published an, an article on that called defending biodiversity through our diet so we can actually make a, a huge difference to habitat clearing um, and climate change through simple dietary um, changes and I feel like when you do that as well like you lots of people also do it for, for an environmental perspective but also from a recognition that um, you know we're related to to animals and I was once having a discussion with um uh, like my physio and I was like so I'm a zoologist and as part of a zoologist you have to do like dissections and I was like you know like you would not know if you were eating like a human if someone put a piece of cooked meat in front of you and you just like you know physically re repulsed but it's it's true like we are you know very closely related to to the species that um we eat um and what, our, our dietary choices are actually having really devastating effects so if we all not not just through diet but through you know um arguing against um, road expansions or more land clearing to, um, you know, put up like football stadiums or new mines, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, habitat loss is sort of like the, the overarching um, issue and um, something that we can address. And I think we also need to you hear so much doom and gloom, like the world's going to shits, like, and I think that that way of, of um, capturing things is very unhelpful because there we actually live in an amazing time we have the ability to do so much good and there is so much good that's being done we've brought back species from extinction um you know we through through captive breeding um we've restored habitats and um you know made some massive changes and you know, when I speak to kids, they are so switched on. They they know about um, species and, and conservation and biodiversity and climate change. And there's so much hope for the future. And I think we really need to instill that hope and that message that we totally can make a difference. Um, we just need to follow the science um, and, and we can, yeah, definitely, um, you know, go on a, a better trajectory. And there's still so much to, to you know live for and and conserve and and you know celebrate um environmental wins i 100 percent agree with that sentiment because we're only going to find solutions if we believe that there are solutions to be found right so that optimism i think is way more helpful than just the kind of laying in our um pessimism and being you know um restricted by it um, so what now that you've got your thesis or you almost have your thesis in for PhD, what's next for you then? Um, so I feel like I've been busier than ever. Um, I've uh, done a little bit of circus um, performing. I'm now um, yeah leading that Australia wide project um, and bring the bees back after bushfires by putting up bee hotels in fire affected areas. I've been doing um, bee surveys for local councils because as I said, we we don't know what bees are where um so been doing surveys finding out like you know the there's so many bees um that haven't been described so um i want to um you know describe some species um i've got a, a species that i'm in the process of describing that i'm naming after my dog um and um i've been uh working on a, a paper um looking at the representation of bees in art and culture. Um, I need, I've got about like 20 half finished papers. I'm not even joking. There's probably more. I made up a massive list. I think there ended up being like 34 that I've started or I've had ideas about. So um, unfortunately, like all these papers, like you don't get 
money to write them. So it's going to have to be in my spare time, <laughs> spare time. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, um, my dog had seven, seven puppies. So I've been a bit of a dog mom, especially because she didn't want to, didn't want to mother them. So that that's been um, taking up my time, but I've been, yeah, I've, I've been loving it. I love going out and doing the bee surveys and, um, yeah, there's, as I said, it's actually like a really exciting time to be doing bee research because whilst there's um, fortunately a lot unknown, like there's a lot, you know, people starting to to realise and, and, you know, realise that we need to do something about biodiversity and about bees um, and more and more people are realising that it's not the honeybees that, that we need to help, it's the native bees and um, yeah, there's, there's so much um, stuff to do that um, is you know, really exciting and so many like you know ecological and, and um evolutionary questions that um need answering so i i've got a lot of stuff that i want to be doing and i think it will keep me busy for the rest of my life um <laughs> with some other like, um, fun stuff in between so uh, how can people reach you if they want to contact you or follow so, you yeah, I've got, um, if you, especially if you want to um, get involved in the Bee Hotel stuff, um, or if you want to read any of my publications, I think I've got uh, about 25 by now. Um, my email is kitprendergast21 at gmail.com. I also have a Facebook group called Bees in the Burbs, which anyone can join. Um, and, um, I've also got a Facebook page, um, that's my, my book, Creating a Haven for Native Bees, and, um, on Twitter, I'm, uh, B Babette, so, um, capital B, E, E, capital B, A, B, E, double T, E, uh, yeah, and, um, I'm on Instagram, but it's pretty much just copies. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Well, I'll put all that information in the show notes so people can get the spelling right and everything. But I do got to say that now that I'm in a master's program and I'm reviewing a lot of papers in the methodology section, I, I, I better understand how much work it takes to do the type of research that you've been doing. So I really thank you for all your contributions. And I'm really inspired. I've always been really inspired by your work. And it's just amazing, like the diversity of things we've talked about today and how much knowledge you've had and how much you've contributed. So thank you so much. And I hope I can contribute that much as well. But I appreciate your time today. And it was great talking with you. Uh, thanks so much. I, I love how you're really, um, you know, been getting the environmental message and, and environmental science um, research out there to the public. So thank you for you. <laughs> All right, take care.